Welcome in Southern California. This is Radio Free Los Angeles. Do you copy? Repeat, do you copy? Now transmitting from behind the Iron Curtain in the People's Republic of California, we bring you the voice of free men, free markets, and limited constitutional government. Welcome to citizen-sponsored Radio Free Los Angeles with President of the California Taxpayers Union, Mike Alexander, and Editor of the Taxpayer Gazette, Jonathan Wilson. Hey, all right, we sure are live here. Mike Alexander, Josh Jacobs, Jonathan Wilson, and tonight my special guest star here, my oldest grandson, Matthew Alexander. How are you this evening, Matthew? Come on up here and say hello. you got to share the microphone yeah. with your grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good, good. Hey, Matthew. D- did you manage to get out of there by yourself tonight? Yeah. Yeah, how many? Get up here. We can't hear <laughs> you, on, son. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not yeah. How about yes? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. You could try <laughs> that on. Left uh, left your, your, your two sisters and your two cousins behind, so you've got bragging rights tonight, huh? All right, well, it's good to have you. Have a seat and, and, and sit if, down. And Matthew's here in the studio with us. And if you want to see Matthew and the rest of us on camera, you can mm-hmm. go to Facebook, Facebook Live, our Radio Free Los Angeles page, and it's streaming right there. Right, Josh? It That's is. That's right. And you can be on TV there, Matthew. And if you'd like to join the program tonight, we'd love to hear from you. The telephone number is 866-870-870. Five seven five two, and uh, don't forget that this is listener supported, citizen supported radio, and the place to go uh, to help support this and keep the program going is radiofreelosangeles.net. dot net. That'll take you to our school choice website, and you can contribute there. Hey, we've got also, uh, yeah, Josh. Go follow ahead. us on Twitter at uh, twitter dot com slash twenty twenty choice. Uh, we like to update the site uh, every day with different stories, so go there as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, <clears throat> we've got a lot of uh, really good things uh, here tonight to talk about. I mean, it's just been a rich weekend. We like to keep a local flair, so uh, we're going to speak with Josh today about his. Uh, uh, attendance yesterday at a, a local event, which is really very much neglected, uh, I think, here. Uh, we, we don't do in Los Angeles because of such a large market and because syndicated programs dominate most of the programming. That's not a complaint on my part, believe me. It's just an observation. But because here are uh, national programs, there's not a lot of attention paid to a lot of the local issues and what government does that tremendously impacts uh, life in the communities. And uh, one of the largest organizations that we have here in Southern California is the Metro or Metropolitan Trans- Transit District or RTD. Do you ever see you know, the, uh, anybody change their name more often than the bus company, <laughs> right? <clears throat> It just first of all, it's a rapid transit. Well, there's nothing rapid about it. Well, those who do paint jobs on buses must love them because they're always having to change the name oh, with their spray paint. Right? It's a gift, I, you know. These guys, but at any rate, they're talking about a new route from North Hollywood to Pasadena. The only problem is, is that it's going to go down uh, uh, what uh, uh, Colorado Boulevard is uh, one yes. of the main routes. See, the problem is that. <clears throat> They had a meeting in Glendale. I live in Glendale now, and so I was not aware of the Glendale meeting. However, late Friday, I discovered the meeting that was in Eagle Rock, and I Uh lived in Eagle Rock for nearly 40 years. And so when I heard about the meeting and what was happening, I'd heard about the project beforehand, so I said, i got to be at this meeting just to give my two cents worth. And met a couple people there that I – or ran into some people I knew – but a lot of people did not know about their complaint. They said, we're not giving this information. Metro's not making this information known. So one of the options that LA or Eagle Rockers want is the 134 freeway. But currently, Metro doesn't even even have that as an option. And that's what a lot of people were upset about. That's what a lot of people were angry about, right. well, was that there was no 134 we, we start, option. We really started mid-stroke. So what this is about is meeting – what they believe is the demand for a more direct route from North Hollywood 
uh, to Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And North Hollywood lies more or less along the 101 uh, Riverside Drive, Lancashire. That's kind of the heart of of North Hollywood there. And uh, and then it runs roughly along the... uh, the 134, which mm-hmm. uh, uh, be, did I say 101 before? It's 134. 134, yeah. Uh, it lies along, which, of course, runs into Pasadena. Now, uh, uh, they're apparently uh, going to run a route. I don't know if the idea is to get more people, be, to pick up more riders between North Hollywood <clears throat> and, uh, and Pasadena, because if your only purpose was to get riders from North Hollywood to Pasadena, mm-hmm. the obvious thing to do is to get on the 134 freeway yeah. and, and and head east. Well, actually, I just took that bus here. The, it Did goes you? From, the 501 goes from Pasadena to North Hollywood, and uh-huh. it stops. It makes this one stop at uh-huh. Rand Boulevard, right right in front of just the building one. here. Just one, right. Yeah. So, so, so clear- they want to go through Eagle Rock. They want to take that bus to Eagle Rock. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, it's a proposed line that would take it from North Hollywood to Glendale to Eagle Rock to Pasadena. Yeah, when you say Pasadena, where in Pasadena? Do you know? They didn't specify where. The problem is they were being very vague on a lot of things. Oh, that's that government. And so that's what people were demanding, saying, what is it specifically? What is your plan? Plus, um, now I can sympathize because there are people there that said, we take the bus right now. It takes us one and a half, two hours, three hours to get to where we need to go. Mm -hmm. And one person there, because we had a lot of people commenting, he said a great solution. He says, instead of, you know, this thing, rerouting this into Eagle Rock, why don't you just put three times as many buses that are already there? Because there's already buses in Eagle Rock, in Pasadena, in Glendale. Have more buses. That'll solve your problem right away without having to pay this big study and do all these things that just are going to complicate things. Not to mention the biggest, uh, another big problem or people had was, will this... Um, basically rezone everything. In other words, would high-rise buildings be allowed in Eagle Rock if this thing were to go through because of the way the bus is or the category of the bus or the category of the express, would you be allowed to build high-rises oh, in Eagle oh, Rock? Oh, so uh, small, hurting small oh, businesses. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So, all right. You know, the question is, okay, are they so we missed it. names? We missed it, didn't we, uh, team? All right. <clears throat> Let's uh, uh, take a little uh, uh, walk down memory lane. So there is a proposal afoot. It may even be law in the state of California. Anything this crazy is uh, uh, bound to be law in our state. But here several months ago, a very controversial bill was introduced into the state legislature. And what it what it basically did, and this echoes what, what is being mm-hmm. discussed, that what you just mentioned, what it did was to change zoning or to override local zoning, including for the city of Los Angeles, which is Eagle Rock, is city of L.A. It overrides the existing uh, uh, zoning so as to permit high rises on the top. So now we know what this is all about, and, and of course, we all knew it wasn't about transportation mm-hmm. because even the even Metro, even those bureaucrats aren't that stupid. No. You know, they know if you want to get buses uh, from one place to the other, they know the fastest way to do that. Mm-hmm. Even you know, they know what to do, and they were doing it. As a matter of fact, so what changed? What changed was the desire to access uh, 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 un uh, or or. What they wanted was to redevelop. Mm-hmm. And, and so you know, the whole state got out of the redevelopment authorities many years. They have been jonesing to get back into the business because there's a tremendous amount of political money that exchanges hands. There's lots of action when it comes to that sort of thing. So there it is. As we know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, all of government, as we know it, at 99%, Maybe 99% plus, give or take a couple of uh, 
basis points is a fraud, a hustle, and a con. And th- this is how the the con is working over there. And they're also doing the road diet thing in Igorog as well, where they eliminated one lane on each side. Yeah. And it was already right. jammed as it was. And I said to the, everybody there, I said, look, it was already congested. It's more congested. Right. And the person who spoke before me at the meeting, he said, most people don't even use those bike lanes. What they'll do is they'll ride on Hill Drive or Yosemite because those streets are right. less crowded. Plus, there's less pollution sure. and well, there's they're just less lying. danger. They're just lying. They don't care about traffic. They don't care about the impact. So not only did they cut those lanes in half, they're proposing to put another ten or 20,000 residents uh, mm-hmm. in high-rise and mixed-use uh, projects along Colorado Boulevard. But I'll bet you those guys weren't there on Saturday, were they? No, no, no. no. Uh, they were talking about uh, transporting people uh, rapidly uh, from one place to the other. What a bunch of nonsense. And a lot of people there were saying, our mayor is nowhere. Our city council member, Jose Weizar, is nowhere. In fact, a couple of them Weasel. mentioned that Weizar or Jose, who, Jose or who, Weasel, or as another person called him Hooser, Hooser uh, yeah. <laughs> is currently under investigation yeah. by the FBI. Yeah, yeah. He has a whole, whole new friends at the FBI. Well, we'll see. Uh, if they're uh, any better at getting at him than they were at Hillary. Well, in any event, talking about our, uh, this has been a uh, a very rich week. And today, as we speak, uh, there's another very local and national issue going on. And that is uh, what we're uh, asked to believe are roundups uh, by, the trust, uh, by the Trump administration. It's good. They apparently have been sending ICE uh, into the neighborhoods. Uh, to to grab people. Now, of course, they're saying they're going after families and so forth. They are not doing anything of the sort. Those orders, as I understand them, and if I have this wrong, uh, somebody can correct me and call in and set us straight here, but I doubt that. What these are are deportation orders uh, that are being enforced. And so after uh, many, many years of being in the United States, playing the system, taking advantage of all the delays, uh, running their their uh, asylum hoax, uh, running their, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, death threat hustle, and, and all this other stuff, all this hardship, all this nonsense, every other means of delay that uh, uh, God, man, or lawyers could come up with, Finally, our system burped up a deportation order after God knows how many years, right? So uh, ICE, uh, uh, the, the, that seems to have been prevented from doing anything else by who, by guess who, by courts, uh, is at least going out there to try to enforce the court orders. And wouldn't you know, that's the most controversial thing being done this week. But I would just uh, 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 point out the complete irony of the situation. What are these ICE guys enforcing? Answer, court orders. And what is it that Trump is told that he must obey at every step of the way in the immigration process? Answer, a court order. So uh, anytime somebody doesn't like what the Trumpster is doing, they haul his uh, uh, backside uh, into a federal court somewhere where some court scolds him and threatens to hold him in contempt if he doesn't obey that order of the court. Well, lo and behold, you know, Trump, he may not be as bright as some people think he is, but he's reasonably uh, bright. Actually, I do think he's bright, but some people say he's not. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he's at least a quick learner. So he says, oh, Maybe I'll try enforcing a court order then, <laughs> if that's the way this thing works. So he goes down there and yeah, finds a, yeah, uh, a couple of thousand Mexicans, Guatemalans, uh, or what are, whatever these uh, various protected from all species the, are. The world is, I mean, yeah, all around the world. There, we, got, we got them floating in here from everywhere. everywhere. So he, he gets a court order, and now that's controversial, don't you know? And I would po- pose the question once again. What law is it that we don't get to obey, that, you know, that we get to, uh, uh, to disobey? What, what laws uh, are there that we get to ignore? Oh, I got a better one for you. What court orders do we get to, uh, to disregard? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, what, I, if I went there and I said to the judge, well, you know, I just missed the court, the judge would throw me in jail, and rightfully so, because I disobeyed the court order. Right. Now, so just, why— 
just a couple legal citizen. J- just a couple of weeks ago, in these same neighborhoods, uh, the uh, uh, you, you had had the feds, you know, rolling into uh, into uh, uh, to whatever block there is, uh, trying to do a sweep or doing this or doing that, and. Uh, and, and what do these guys do? You know, they 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 are given little sheets of paper, you know, in in English and in Spanish, and they're told what to say. And one of those things that they're told not to say is, "You are in violation of a court order. You can't do this. It is against the law, don't you know? Right? I I I just I I am absolutely stunned that we have this. Uh, uh, this complete travesty, this uh, com- complete cognitive cognitive dissonance in our public discussion, where where one guy uh, and one and his supporters that uh, would be Donald Trump and our uh, uh, and his supporters, you know, we are told uh, that we must obey the laws, we must do what courts tell us to. And we are told in unending detail what it is. And by the way, that's just the immigration. That's on top of hundreds of thousands of other, and probably millions of other laws, rules, and regulations that we are absolutely supposed to comply with every day, right down to the penny, right down to uh, to the last postage stamp. We better get our taxes in on time. And if they're one day late, you know, you're going to owe a penalty. The internal ripoff service is going to go after you. That's correct. And they're going to show up and there isn't, there isn't a single court in the land that you can go to to get the IRS off of your back. What you're supposed to do, you got a problem with those boys, you pay them the money first and, and then, <laughs> then you then you ask them to see if you couldn't pretty please get it back. It's absolutely outrageous. Now, uh, it's a wonderful Sunday night. I know it's hot, uh, but some of you got to be listening to the radio out there. Please join us at air at eight six six eight seven zero five seven five two and uh, 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 share your observations with us. Now we're uh, uh, we're, we're coming up on the uh, the end of the first half hour. At the end of uh, uh, tomorrow night's uh, uh, ha- thank you. At the end of uh, tomorrow night's uh, half hour, excuse me, this afternoon's final half hour, we are going to have our Government Grifter of the Week Award. We're also going to discuss some of uh, my friend Ed Ring's proposal on how to transform California in one election. <laughs> and All right. I haven't laughed this so uh, much since seeing uh, George right. Goble having his uh, right. Ma- drink. Matthew's in the studio. He's clowning around. He's, he's right. rubbing his grandfather's head. All right. <laughs> you know, you could be sent back with those other low life cousins of yours. You know, yeah, back at this the, is serious the house stuff. This is Radio Free Los Angeles. That's right. This isn't the Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Although we're big fans of Johnny Carson. Oh, huge fans. Huge fans. Yeah, we uh, was. I don't know if it was you guys here, but uh, uh, here here a couple of weeks ago, we we uh, some of us here were talking about stumbling across some of the older Johnny Carson uh, interviews, uh, and uh, on on uh, uh, YouTube. YouTube, and and you know you slide right back into many of those people you know you knew back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you probably have seen that very same interview live at some point, mm-hmm. and it is remarkable just how good Johnny Carson is. Remarkable just how good the Tonight Show was, the oh, production yeah. values, you know, the guests, and um, uh, and the you know the, the, some of the discussions were topical. I don't think that the current political issues. Uh, uh, there hit it. Uh, for example, there was an interview with Reagan, but he, on the Johnny Carson shows, he never did do politics. Not you know, right he now. he did Hollywood. He did entertainment. He kind of uh, ripped on Reagan a little bit. Well, yeah, he. I mean, he but, wasn't a fan of Reagan. I although think. Nancy Reagan, when Johnny Carson died, she did pay tribute. She said, "Ronnie and I used to love to watch the Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson." And Johnny Carson did, you know impersonate Reagan and kind of made fun oh. like there was one episode where Richard Dawson was playing a mock family feud and Reagan was up and was like name something you dig <laughs> President Reagan well show me well ding 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 
Number one answer. <laughs> Play a pass, <laughs> you know, just right. Oh, well, he's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful uh, en- entertainer, and and I, you know, and the the, the Reagans were Hollywood, and and you know they they gave and got a lot. There was always a lot of uh, uh, ribbing, and they anybody else in the entertainment industry, they gave them a pretty wide berth uh, to do their business. I mean, I I saw. Uh, uh, Don Rickles at the inauguration. That's right, yeah. And, and, you know, so uh, it, and some of those things uh, that Rickles said at his, I think it was his first one, 1980, mm-hmm. uh, right, first inauguration, they were a little edgy. Oh, yeah. They're kind of aggressive. And, uh, you know, first of all, I'm obviously uh, not, uh, not, not uh, uh, Don Rickles, uh, but. Uh, some of those jokes I wouldn't have made, but you know, Ronald Reagan and Nancy, they knew him well. There was mm-hmm. a lot of respect uh, there. It was, uh, it, was, it was fantastic. That was the thing about Don Rickles was that he did it in – he insulted, but he did it in kind of a goofy yeah. way. You couldn't take it like, oh, my gosh, yeah. this guy's a hateful, bitter old man. Yeah. He did it in such a goofy way. It was so hilarious that you know he, 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 only, he said, I only made fun of people that I love, that I cared about. Yeah. Uh, he says, I didn't you know, make fun of people I spied. In fact, Don Rickles had so many friends in Hollywood that oh. he was friends with – people who were enemies of each other so he said sometimes i had to be this like balancing act because i was oftentimes walking on eggshells because i was friends with one person who hated another person but who liked me that's right Uh, so well he was uh yeah he was uh uh he was definitely uh a very friendly fellow and uh uh and and really widely loved well we're coming up on the end of uh the, the first half hour here in the next half hour right All right, Uh, Jeff tells us two minutes and 30 seconds. In the next half hour, we're going to dig into some very important issues on education, which is, you know, one of our uh, signature issues here on Radio Free Los Angeles. We're going to be talking about uh, about reading scores. We're going to be talking about new legislation in uh, Sacramento that is designed to reduce educational quality by reducing and eliminating tests that certain uh, uh, that teachers, uh, teaching candidates, uh, candidates for certificates, mm. have to take and pass in order to be permitted to teach in California. It has to do with uh, the primary skill, teaching uh, uh, how, how to read. And uh, it, it is a, really a remarkable battle that should be going on at this time, especially uh, when when the Los Angeles Unified School District and others are 48th in the nation. You would think that we would not be having these kinds of uh, discussions. Uh, we're also going to be talking about new mandates here in the state of California that will require California State University students to take an ethnic studies class. So they're you know they're mandating uh, certain kinds of social awareness is clearly political, and and the battle uh, for the minds, hearts, and souls of our students continue. So they keep them ignorant uh, in grammar school, keep them that way all the way through. All right, Mike Alexander, Josh Jacobs, Jonathan Wilson, and Doofy over here. Uh, that would be Matthew Alexander. We'll be back with you in the second half hour, Radio Free Los Angeles. Transmitting from behind the Iron Curtain in the People's Republic of California, we bring you the voice of free men, free markets, and limited constitutional government. Welcome to citizen-sponsored Radio Free Los Angeles with President of the California Taxpayers Union, Mike Alexander, and Editor of the Taxpayer Gazette, Jonathan Wilson. Good evening, everybody out there. This is Mike Alexander, Josh Jacobs, and Jonathan Wilson, Radio Free Los Angeles, and our special backup here. That would be my young, my oldest grandson here. That's uh, Matthew Alexander. 
and uh, yeah, he's gonna, yeah, he's pretty amped up on that, uh, Doctor Pepper. He is. Uh, I, I, th- I think I think he's. Yeah, I think he thinks he's super Matt. I yeah, know. somebody, but maybe somebody will have some of these samples from these health shows around here. <laughs> Nitty event. We, uh, we we hope you'll be part of our show tonight. Eight six six eight seven zero five seven five two. Uh, call in, be part of the show. We'd love to have you. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube. How do they do that, Jonathan? Facebook. 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 Yeah. Go to YouTube, our Facebook, Facebook page, Radio Free Los Angeles. Yes. And we're streaming live. So you can watch and listen on Facebook. Absolutely. Well, you know, we have uh, uh, we have, have a caller here who is uh, going to be talking about some of the subjects that we have uh, here in, in California. Maybe we'll lead off by speaking with him, and then we'll get uh, use that perhaps as an opportunity to discuss some of these recent things. Uh, on line one, we have Sam from Encino. How are you this evening, Sam? It's good to have you call again. Hello? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. All right. We well, still out. All right. We well, still being screened, as they say, when he comes up. Uh, you, you know. Uh, the, in in the last week here, uh, there was, a, in fact, several times in the last few months, there's been an attempt in the California legislature to change the licensing requirements for uh, aspiring uh, teachers, that is, uh, uh, young college graduates or otherwise who are trying to get a, a teaching certificate. One of the things that you have to do is that you have to uh, pass a test uh, demonstrating your ability to teach children in certain grade uh, levels how to read, and it's basically using the phonics method. Mm-hmm. So there's this uh, one gal in California here. Uh, I uh, need to use the restroom. Okay. Um, the uh, excuse me, we we had a technical difficulty there. For, um, there's this uh, one gal in California, she's a Democrat, who introduced a, a bill that would have eliminated that. And she, uh, her argument uh, for that was that it was making it unnecessarily difficult for youngsters to get these teaching certificates, right? And, and it was inefficient and a waste of money. And basically what it's about to, uh, to do is to reignite uh, the reading wars uh, in the uh, state of California, because at one time we had uh, what we called the uh, uh, we, we, for many years we had the phonics method. Then mm-hmm. in the seventies and eighties there was an attempt to move on to whole readings. Uh, that I'm not did even not sure work. It, it did not work. It was very controversial. And here in the state of California, they actually got together and mandated uh, phonics. Uh, uh, it was uh, reintroduced then. That was over 20 years ago. Now, obviously, uh, someone's trying to eliminate that as a requirement so it doesn't have to be taught. And when they try to drop that requirement, it means that they're headed in another direction. So a uh, a, a state whose schools are already almost the worst in the nation – Proposed to embrace teaching uh, methodologies that are known to have problems. In fact, many would argue that they're proven failures, and now we want to introduce them. I, I, how could things get any worse? Uh, we have to get a lot better. But in any event, I now have Sam uh, from Encino, who is ready to speak with us. Sam, it's good to have you on again. How are you this evening? Fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, just a, a sort of a warning, you know, with the school voucher uh, initiative yes. that hopes to get on the ballot in November 2020. Yes. You should be made aware that, you know, the teachers union could go and, and talk to the state attorney general and have it worded in a way saying, you know, in a, in a very adverse, adversarial uh, yes. way, uh, totally disguising its true intent, saying, sure. like, initiative to destroy the public schools. Yeah, right. Yo, well, actually, if they would write that down, that would get us votes, Sam. Yeah, you know, I've had, as you might imagine, and I'm not exaggerating too much, uh, 
the uh, uh, it, it is so important uh, for us to reflect on these things, and I'm glad that you brought them uh, to our attention. It'll come as no surprise to you that we are acutely aware of Comrade Becerra's uh, bad habits of rewriting initiatives. He did that to the recent gas tax repeal. It, it does happen. Uh, there's... Uh, and he will inevitably do something like that uh, in this case. But that threat, Sam, ought not to deter us because otherwise it permits them to be lawless and they don't even have to pay the price of defending it. Do you see what I mean? Oh, I understand. Yeah, so it means that we'll have to be ready to take them to court, probably introduce it early enough and so forth, and we can litigate it. It'll, It'll be... Uh, the uh, the most uh, uh, it'll be the most hotly uh, contested issue in the history of our republic. I guarantee you, uh, no presidential election that we've had will be more uh, contentious, uh, more uh, vicious, uh, more hard fought. The only th- in fact, if they can get the money together, they'll probably spend more money on this than on any other uh, uh, election in, in recent memory. Um, yeah, what is, what is, what, what's your thinking about this, Sam? Well, my thinking is, yeah, yeah, yes, you're right, but that means you don't want to take it, you don't want it to wind up in the state Supreme Court because they, will, in a, they won't hear it. In other words, you probably right. you may win at the Superior Court level, and you'd lose at the appellate court level. And then what happened with the gas tax? The Supreme Court said, well, we're not going to hear this. Right. It's well, that always sure. happens. And I mean, uh, and so, I, and so, one, one last little thing. Yeah. So you need to be able to somehow get it into federal court as a free speech issue. Yeah. Or something like that, where a federal court could sit there and say no. And he could literally order the attorney general to say no, you should have it. Uh, written as state as intended. Yes, I, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, are, are you a lawyer, Sam? No, I'm not. Oh, I was just no, curious. I'm, no. Where else are you going to go? Because if it winds up in the yeah. state Supreme Court, you'll lose. Yeah, I was just wondering, well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, here, in, I was just wondering if anybody could cite a case where the state attorney general and or the governor had been taken to federal court on a, an initiative issue and defeated. I mean, uh, it's uh, I, I, I question whether the federal courts have any jurisdiction at all in, in this area, uh, although the fundamental underlying issues that, that will ultimately be raised by a school choice will be uh, of constitutional uh, uh, Importance, and we'll have uh, both uh, federal and state constitution, and we'll raise both federal and state constitutional issues. And you know, Sam, what, uh, as as I was on my my way over here tonight, uh, I was uh, uh, thinking about the uh, about how how these uh, legislatures and teachers and other social engineers uh, will complain. And they'll talk about everything else, but they they will not ad- address uh, in open debate the fundamental issue of why shouldn't the parents be able to control the educational uh, the education of their children, the educational choices that they make? Why shouldn't they? It, it's a very fundamental question. Now they'll reply, they'll move off center. They'll say, "Well, it'll destroy the public schools. It'll do this, or it'll do that, or it's more effective, or whatever." But they'll never deal with the fundamental, basic issue, and that is: Should parents be able to direct the education of their children? Yes or no? So you know they uh, they they acknowledge it, uh, and. Uh, uh, and yet refuse uh, to to debate it. Uh, they will acknowledge it at one level, say, yes, they can, if they can afford it, but then they withhold the money, right? They tax it away from you. So uh, now the, we're going to uh, uh, back right into the basic issues of Gideon versus Wainwright 
and that was the uh, uh, the case back in the 60s, I think. might have been later, but that was the one that dealt with the right of counsel. And that's where that other part of the so-called Miranda warnings come, uh, come up. Uh, you know, you, you have a right to have an attorney. If you can't afford one, one will be appointed to represent you. So in Gideon versus Wainwright, the United States Supreme Court acknowledged the right of a uh, of a defendant to an attorney, and further acknowledged that a right was hollow <clears throat> if you didn't have the means to exercise it. And since we're talking about how an education is a fundamental right, it seems to me very difficult uh, for the state to withhold it. So we can acknowledge an obligation on the part of the state uh, to support education without implying the corollary right of the state to coerce uh, children and families into educational programs against their will. So I, I I do think we're going uh, that that you're correct, Sam. That we're going to have a lot of, of First Amendment uh, issues raised uh, in this that will inevitably uh, end up in the courts. Um, uh, uh, did you other, go ahead? Yeah, one other thing. You know, since the gas tax went up in July by about what five point six cents. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I think it. It makes sense for the Republican Party to try to put it on the ballot again on twenty in twenty twenty. Yes, because because it will go up again in July one twenty twenty. Yes. Okay, and no one, I don't think, no one thought they thought you know, well, it's a one time gas tax thing. Mm-hmm. But no one thought that. I didn't expect it, and I don't think anybody else did expect an increase. Every July first, since the, since the uh, tax is indexed to inflation, along I guess with the vehicle licensing or registration fees, um, uh, and so I think it, it. But but there's a problem, you know, what Governor Brown did, and I think Prop EE demonstrates that clearly. He went and said all statewide referendums need to be in November in an election year, and they are now referendums. They could happen in July or June, like when you had um, yeah, Democratic prim- and Republican primary voting in the past. Yeah, they don't have that anymore. They're all in November. Yeah, so now they're all in November <clears throat> yeah. because it gives the Democrats an advantage to, you know, where people will just go down ballot voting. You know, they, they're just told, you know, their minions are told, you know, just vote no on this or yes on that. It makes it very hard. Uh, for uh, for an initiative, uh, you know, to get any attention, I happen to know that on on uh, just to help support your point, that that uh, uh, the Carl DeMaio and the others who are helping to promote uh, you know, the gas tax uh, repeal were very uh, concerned about what Becerra had done to them, and. Uh, and I'm not speaking for Carl here. I don't have any uh, special inside information. But my feeling is is that they're going to hold off for a while. Uh, how about you, Jonathan? What are your impressions? You, you've uh, yeah, spent a I lot think, of time on I think on they're that. sort of sitting back and, and waiting to fix that process. Yeah. Or, or because, I don't know how we fix it. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. Uh, and and, and l- let me say this also, uh, Sam, why I think that uh, – that School choice is very different. They want to talk about destroying the public schools, so forth and so on. That's fine. You know, gas taxes, you would think, uh, are, are, are readily uh, uh, understood. But it turns out to be a little bit more complex than you might think. But school choice is quite different, especially our proposal, which is centered around the educational savings account and the – the program is very simple. Uh, following passage of the initiative, the state will establish an educational savings account in the name of uh, each K-12 through child in the state of California. Number two, into that account will be deposited annually the average per pupil expenditure under Proposition 98. That amount is currently $15,000. Number three, that money in that account 
can be used at the parent's discretion to send their child to a school of their choice, an accredited school of their choice, whether it's public, private, charter school, or parochial school. The number four, anything that's left over in that account can be used for other qualified educational expenses or saved in use for college. Now, uh, in what, 30, 45 seconds, I summarized for you exactly what we're doing. It is 10 times easier to understand than the uh, the tax repeal formula in the recent gas tax repeal. And it means money in the pocket of, of the average uh, working family who can understand bad education. And when they hear that $15,000 per year, per child, uh, and use whatever's left over for college, <clears throat> I don't think that there's anything that the government can tell them that will dissuade them. What do you think, Sam? Well, I, I agree with most of what you're saying, but I think that the gas tax repeal failure <laughs> was, only due, was only due yeah. to the fact that they reworded the, the, uh, the, the ballot initiative to say, well, you're taking money away from road repair and bridge, you know, roads yeah, and bridges. Yeah, right. And from starving children and uh, endangered species, you know the whole the whole tiresome liberal no, 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 uh, no, no, list no. of they horribles. Had, they had they had their their un their statewide union uh, people, such as the Highway Patrol, right? I know Cal Fire and and all these will get on and say, oh, you know, we won't we won't have money to repair the roads, and right? And that. Exactly. Okay. And, and and no, but the but the the failure of the Republicans because of a lot a lack of money was to rebut that. And, and first of all, what no one has said, what no one has said, is prior to the gas tax increase, how much money per year did the gas tax generate, and and the vehicle license fee, right, uh, and, and yep. the vehicle registration fee, how much per year did it generate before that point? And they should have said, look at all this money and, the, and right. what they usually do up in Sacramento, the scum, the line cheating scum, is <laughs> that they always divert that money to other things. Of course That's they do, yeah. And, 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 and this raises the whole problem of, of fundamental illiteracy, both political and economic and, and uh, linguistic illiteracy in our grammar schools and, and, uh, and high schools and into the college. That is where I think that uh, we're really running uh, up against it. Josh, you had a point to make? Yeah, the LA Times this morning just made the case for school choice. In oh. an article by John Myers titled, Nearly All of California's Crises Are Worse in Its Latino Communities, New Report Says. I'll just read the part where they talk about education inequality. It's a very brief... Right. It says, quote, Ed, educational inequality further complicates the picture. The report notes that many Latino students are, quote, disproportionately attending segregated and underperforming schools, end quote, and have less access to the resources that would prepare them for college. Right. Latino students have high school graduation rates below the overall state average. Fewer than one in three young Latino men do well enough in their studies to be eligible for admission to a University of Cal California or right. Cal State University campus, and no ethnic group has a small array of success at earning four-year college degrees, nor has any other group seen such anemic improvement in those numbers All right, since Josh. 2000. Okay, now, uh, you know, uh, I want you to read the rest, and then it, at the end, it's going to recommend, of course, that we spend more money on. The fact is, we got so many, uh, so many. It did not actually. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we'll get back to it. Sam, I want I want to thank you for calling in tonight. We got a few other callers here. Are you a, a currently a supporter of our uh, station, Sam? You mean, uh, yeah. Uh, Do you actually I mean, I support school choice by supporting school choice? If not, you need to go to School Choice 22. Yeah, go to the website and support it because it is the single most important thing that is going to be done in in the next 10 years. The next two years. Go ahead, Uh, Jonathan. The web address is schoolchoice.com. 
2020.org. That's the deal. We get together. We do this. We're going to take care of all these problems. And all those Mexican kids down there, they'll, they'll get access to good schools all right, and they'll be on fire just like anybody else. Uh, hey, Sam, thanks for calling in. Don't be a stranger, my friend. Next up, we have Gloria from Huntington Beach who wants to talk about sex. <laughs> How are you, Gloria? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I got off work already, so I, I'm, I'm happy to give you a call. <laughs> um, I, I want to find out, I, I heard something on the radio recently yeah. that uh, Planned Parenthood has put some little curriculum together with the schools that they're going to teach sex education to kindergartners. Oh, yes. Kindergarten. That's right. And I'm I'm sort of outraged by this. I mean, this yeah. is just ridiculous. Well, and, y- and, and my other question is, after yes. uh, you tell me about that, um, to homeschool, uh, does it have to be a parent that homeschools? Or could someone like me go to their house and homeschool their children? So well, those are my two uh, things for uh, you. Today. You know, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, that you could go to uh, – I've got a bunch of homeschoolers out there. I'm sure somebody will call in. But the very essence of homeschooling is that it is not regulated by the government, all right? So there's okay. no – there's no so you can learn any way that you want. And a lot of these homeschool uh, families – uh, take turns teaching courses because they obviously have many of the families who are dissatisfied with the schools are dissatisfied with them not only on social grounds that or religious grounds but also on plain educational grounds so uh, mm-hmm. often uh, times these homeschooling families are among the uh, most highly educated parents uh, and, and they are thoroughly capable of teaching uh, in the schools. In fact, that's one of the problems for a lot of us uh, uh, who have had families. Uh, yeah, I, you know, uh, and this happens so often where, where the parents are almost uniformly better educated, smarter, more cultured, better spoken, better everything than the so-called teachers. And yet they, exactly. put, the, they put their kids uh, in these schools and, and all of a sudden little Miss Marple uh, has her... Uh, uh, her teaching certificate, and uh, now she's in charge, don't you know? And she sits there and tells tells the parents. That's why I had a lot of trouble uh, with, with these uh, uh, young gals and the old ones too, or meaner than hell, some of them, and uh, required a lot of discipline from uh, from me uh, in the educational process. So we didn't always get along. The only place that I, di- I didn't have to supervise or worry about was when I sent my sons to the Jesuits. Now, by golly, those guys know how to run a high school, right? And those mm-hmm. are men, and they're in charge. So everything went fine there. But all the rest of grammar school was, uh, you know, was uh, uh, was a tough part. But no, uh, Gloria, they are determined to sexualize our, our children, uh, and uh, and at the same time, it's imp- you know, it's impossible to teach about sex without teaching some normative values about it, right, wrong, or different. But uh, they are up to it, and that's a major reason why we have to put education back in the hands of the children and the uh, the money as well. Well, Gloria, that music you hear means that we're coming up on the uh, okay. uh, on the top of the hour. It's been wonderful talking to you. Uh, always love hearing from you here. Stick with us now. Uh, we'll be back with you after the news uh, to continue our discussion, including our Government Grifter of the Week Award uh, with Juan Tierra. Back with you. Southern California. This is Radio Free Los Angeles. Do you copy? Repeat. Do you copy? Now transmitting from behind the Iron Curtain in the People's Republic of California, we bring you the voice of free men, free markets, and limited constitutional government. Welcome to citizen-sponsored Radio Free Los Angeles. 
with President of the California Taxpayers Union, Mike Alexander, and editor of the Taxpayer Gazette, Jonathan Wilson. All right, back with you, everybody. Radio Free Los Angeles coming to you from Glendale, California, the studios of KRLA, AM870, The Answer. And uh, we have here tonight, uh, this is Mike Alexander. I've got Jonathan Wilson. I have Josh Jacobs. And I also have my oldest grandson here, Matthew Alexander. He's been on the show before. How are you this evening, Matthew? Good. All right. All right. You having, having fun here? You're on vacation with uh, Grandma and Grandpa here for a couple of weeks, right? Uh-huh. All right. And you're going to do everything that you are told, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, you're going to do it right away, just like you're a Marine, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I can't hear you. All right. At any rate, uh, we're having... I a- can't hear you. Oh, <laughs> I don't want to blow out the microphones, yeah. But uh, in any event, yeah, we were. Uh, yeah, we've got one tiara, and uh, the, um, the government grifter of the week awards coming up. But you know, this is a good good time, uh, you know, to continue our discussion of what's going on in the schools and what's going on generally in our country. So there's uh, you know, we we have have uh, uh, this. Uh, this general sense of uh, lawlessness that's taken off across the country. Uh, this is framed as uh, Donald Trump versus everybody. But as a matter of fact, it, it is us against uh, the the left. It, it, we are the problem. You know, Donald Trump is easily dealt with if he's just one guy. Yeah, he's president, but it doesn't count for much if uh, if you don't have the rest of uh, – of the country behind you, Donald Trump is not never uh, ha- has been uh, the uh, you know the total target here. The target is us. We're the ones that are not going along. And if you look at whether it's public education or you've got this uh, our, our latest screwball here, uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez or whatever the hell her name is, so uh, her chief of staff. Well, which is the one who's obviously doing the thinking for her there. She's not that bright. She just runs her mouth. But this uh, this guy here, as everybody knows by now, uh, was in some type of a conference with ever, other uh, government uh, uh, bureaucrats here, and he spills the beans. Uh, his name is Sakat Chakrabarti uh, uh, admitted that the true motivation behind introducing the new, the Green New Deal is to overhaul the entire economy. Well, yes, of course we knew it. But, but as we were talking about before the show, uh, uh, Jonathan, there's no such thing as the economy. What, what the hell do you mean when you say economy? Uh, it, it, it's, it's a vague concept. It's intangible. When we talk about an economy, what are we really talking about? We're talking about what people do with their money. We're talking what people do. We're talking about the behavior of individuals. That's what we're talking about. So when they say this, this, this idiot, this, uh, this tyrant, this would-be dictator says he wants to overhaul the entire economy. It means he wants to overhaul the entire population of the United States. He wants to tell us what to do. And so you, you look at the schools. They're now going to be – got some idiot here in the state of California who used to be some professor – of uh, African American studies or some such nonsense at San Diego State University, so now they're introducing a uh, a new bill that is uh, going to require that every student that that attends a California State University college uh, uh, attend and pass um, a, a an ethnic studies class. So guess what perspective that's going to be? How do you pass a class? It's filled with nothing but opinion. Uh, once upon a time, uh, blacks were enslaved. Okay, fine. And uh, people of color didn't have money at one time or another. All right, most of us knew that going in. What's the purpose? Indoctrination. They want to keep it going from K through 12. They're pushing us around. They're telling us what they want us to do. They're 
They're telling us where to go. They're telling us what we can do with our property. Most of all, they're telling us what we're going to do with our children. And and, and, uh, Cortez and all the rest of them, and she isn't very much different from the average Republican, who's more than happy to support this nonsense. You tell me which Republicans are out there today, this last week or this last month, supporting school choice. It's crickets out there. We're out there spreading the word, and I've got conservatives running around pursuing their pet peeves and whatnot. I've got Republicans who are just asleep. Those of them who aren't also already retired in Colorado or some other low tax state, uh, you know that well. Colorado is not low tax, but the weather's better uh, for some people. Well, it's more uh, purple than California, that's for sure. Yeah, boy, I'll tell you what. Yeah, it's it's crazy. We're being pushed around every day at every time by every law by every one of these people, and that's why they are absolutely determined to take over our schools because what they're doing here is systematically dismantling our economy, systematically dismantling our country, systematically dismantling our culture and our constitution. And it's deliberate in the entire uh, rule of law that is involved in the entire thing. And so uh, once again, you know, we've got, uh, 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 you know, we've got uh, you know the president out here today, uh, uh, pushing back at a bunch of these people, Talib and Oman and Hoochie Gucci or whatever. Uh, you know their goofy names are these days. Uh, these people are here lecturing us on our system, right? When they come from another country, but you know, to tell you the truth, Tal- Talib and Oman and whoever these people are, they're not the worst. Who's the worst? The worst of the people actually invade across the border, and they get here, and they sit here, and they tell us what the law is, right? They tell us what we can't do. And just the other day, they raised the flag over the ice center. Where was it? New York or something like that? Colorado. Colorado. They raised the, was it the Mexican flag? Aurora, Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, We don't have an invasion the most, I, I mean, yeah, they take down the American flag and raise the Mexican flag. What do you think would happen if you tried that in Tijuana? They wouldn't let you. You, you wouldn't. You'd be lucky if you were alive still. But, yeah, first of all, you wouldn't have gotten in under the same circumstances, right? And they wouldn't let you do it, and they shouldn't. Yeah. No. And what, what do you think uh, uh, if one of our kids went down there, like one of these Antifa or Antifa uh, people? And, and uh, tried to stunt like that and got himself killed, uh, you know, would, would we say that his rights were violated? No, we say, well, my, my son was stupid, right? What the heck was he thinking when he went down there? But yet we're suffering and all. So what it is... It, well, an Antifa it, terrorist was just uh, killed by, uh, because he was trying to uh, violate or, or, or attack an ICE center. I think it was in Washington. Yeah, Tacoma, and, Washington. You know... And now, you know, they're making look at Antifa is making look at like a martyr. Yeah, well, we need more Antifa martyrs. I, uh, I think. <laughs> well, they, they, they dress yeah. like they dress I, like Star Wars villain Kylo I, Ren. I, they say I, they're anti-fascist. I think that they're to be encouraged, right? Uh, you know, uh, just you know, bring bring them on. Come one, come all. Uh, you know, we we love to hear from you. Uh, uh, all of you Antifa people, we should have Antifa Day, right out in front of ICE, right? We can have uh, uh, we we can have target practice here. But but let's l- let's look at what's going on here. We have all these people who arrogantly attack everything that we stand for. Yeah, you know, they're opposed to our uh, to our Judeo Christian culture. They are opposed to our approach to sexuality or sexual mores. They deny us the right to communicate our values to our children. They deny us and fight us over what we're going to teach our children about who we are, where we came from, uh, our relationship with God, our relationship with history. They don't want us to teach anything about history. They don't want our children to know anything. They don't even want to know that they were, uh, that they're wrong. You know, yesterday I, I was at a wedding uh, for uh, one of my granddaughters up in um, 
San Luis Obispo. And uh, I met a very nice gentleman, and uh, I've uh, forgotten his uh, last name. I wouldn't say it on the air anyway. But uh, he, he'd had a couple of older daughters, and then uh, uh, he and his wife uh, uh, adopted a couple of little Asian girls, and uh, one was still in college, one had graduated, and we got to talking about careers. One uh, uh, was very fluent in French and uh, had taken basic business courses. She was thinking about uh, private banking, a few other things. And uh, uh, as we, we got to, you know, to talking uh, here uh, about, about these realities, these kids hadn't heard anything except what they heard from their dad. And we're hearing from people like me and... Uh, uh, and, and I and I don't know who it was. Uh, the mother was good, uh, but the aunt was nuts uh, and uh, left when we started talking about uh, the economy. And as I was saying to these young girls, I said, it, it must be terrible to be who you are uh, and to spend all these many years, 22 years, all this money that you've invested in what you call an education and to get out and to spend five minutes talking to somebody like your dad and me and come to the horrible, horrible conclusion that you don't know a damn thing. You really didn't learn anything that was reliable. You were propagandized. You were, you were, you were taught nonsense. But worse yet, worse yet is the horrible real equally horrible realization that what you do know and what you spent all that time and money on is just wrong now isn't that a bummer to spend spend that amount of time and and as i was telling these uh you know these girls i said hey look your daddy and i here uh don't have any other agenda than to make it better for for you guys, I mean, because we're 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 damn near dead. Yeah, you know, we, we got enough money, we got enough time. Probably before the whole thing really just blows up, Matthew. Probably before the whole thing blows up, guys like me will be gone. And there's lots of people uh, my age. I'm talking about late sixties and seventies that have just given it up. They're phoning it in. They've taken their retirements. And uh, and they've just uh, they've just given up. The problem is students are taught what to think, not how to think. That's correct. I want students to be able to give an argument. Okay, you like Donald Trump? Give me the reason why. Why do you do that? Right. You don't like Donald Trump? Give me the reason why. You like Hillary Clinton? Give me the reason why. You don't like Hillary Clinton? Give me the reason why. Give us the re- teach these kids to think. Okay, here's the reason why I want to vote for this person. Rather than okay, you need to you know only think like Hillary Clinton or think think like Donald Trump. I don't want that at all. I want them right. free thinkers, not group thinkers. Sure, that's right, and and that's exactly what we what we have to do. And, and in these schools, uh, it is absolutely in our best interest to make sure that the that these kids do it. For example, the statistic that you wrote, excuse me, read here out of the L.A. Times article. They say two out of the three of, of these uh, young kids uh, in East Los Angeles or wherever don't have the grades that they need uh, to uh, you know to get into uh, uh, to Cal State, uh, LA, to Cal State LA. LA, and those places are easy to get into. Uh, most of the work that they're doing in the community colleges and at these colleges is now remedial, and they can't even get up to the remedial level. It's so bad. Well, that's K-12 through failure. To tell you the truth, the only good news about it, the only reason I believe that we have so many Latinos on our side is that we have so many dropouts. So by dropping out of high school they, and not going to college, they've gotten away from a great deal of the brainwashing mm-hmm. and the um, uh, propaganda, the propaganda, and and are uh, are living in the real world, pursuing real jobs. Those are the young men and women that we need to help to get vocational training so they can be in a job. That's Not what everybody lacking these days is vocational training. It's huge, and yet they do. There is vocational training, and what is it? They drop out of school and go go to work with their dad or their uncle or the guy next door. 
uh, unfortunately, they don't learn anything else along the way, and it's terrible. Now, we got uh, Dave from Whittier. Dave, is call- how are you this evening, Dave? Are, are, are you calling to tell me that you finally signed up on our website and are now a monthly contributor? <laughs> Mike, I have been I have been so busy taking care of my friend who's sick again. It's just really hard. A right sick now, friend? Well, that's yeah, that's that's what the girls time. that I wanted to date used to tell me on Saturday night. They said, "Oh, I'd really like to, but I got a sick friend." <laughs> All right, Dave. Yeah. Mike, All right. Oh. fire away. You got you got you got okay. two minutes. Make it good. Okay. Um, several things. No. Nope. Several things. One Mike, thing. I appreciate that you're talking about. <laughs> Um, uh, different topics that are uh, in the forefront. This L.A. police chief, what an outrage. He's actually coming against federal law when he's a lawman, coming That's against correct. deportation law. This is an outrage, Mike, and something has to be done. We need to be out there protesting him, demanding his resignation, and Newsom. Now, when SB, what he's, uh, what he's supporting is sanctuary city law, on a, but on a different level, deportation. You know, he is for sanctuary cities. It's um, Newsom and and the L.A. police chief because they've said it. The L.A. police chief said that too. But literally coming out against federal law, he's in my view he's interfering with the law and he's committing um, a, a form of obstruction of justice by doing that. Well, yeah. And, uh, literally. Well, well, the curious uh, thing, Dave, uh, it, it is that law, law, what's the law? So uh, this is why California. And, and other cities uh, run by uh, left-wing Democrats, and maybe that's redundant to, to say that, have been referred to as a modern confederacy. That is, they reject the supremacy of uh, America, of uh, federal law in the areas that have long since uh, been defined as areas of federal law. In fact, immigration, uh, I, I don't think the states could uh, pass immigration laws if they wanted to, uh, to exclude uh, foreigners or regulate their admission. It, it's been federal since the very beginning. So these guys not not only re- reject uh, uh, federal immigration laws, they reject the federal government in this area. And yet, when they don't get their way, what do they do? They run to the federal government called a federal court uh, in order to get an order. Dave, uh, yeah. thanks uh, uh, for, and then assist that we obey that law, even at the same time that they say we don't have to obey other federal laws. Go figure. David, go to schoolchoice2020.org uh, and prove that you don't, love don't me. Don't hold your breath on Dave. <laughs> I have a feeling he, he'll never contribute. God bless. <laughs> All right. Show us the money. Hey. All right. Uh, well, uh, we're coming up the end of the day. It's that magic time. Uh, uh, we have any music in there, Maestro? There we and are. now it's time for the weekly Government Grifter Award. And here he is, Le Mazur Juan Tierra. Le Mazur. Hey, how are how you, you this doing? evening, Juan? Fine. All right, good, good. What's going on? Who and what? New outrage do you have for us tonight? Can you top last week? Last I week so. you had you you had I, I think you had, you you had a trifecta. You had three of them uh, well, that were over five hundred thousand dollars for last year. Well, there's a zinger in here tonight. All right. This week, your humble intrepid researcher <laughs> has been looking at the massive Los Angeles County bureaucracy and there's some real anomalies. Well, mm-hmm. One really stood out. There's a department called Pharmacy Services which has Three classifications of chief, Roman numerals 1, 2, and 3. Oh. Uh, between the three, 1, 2, and 3, there are 20. That's a lot of chiefs, so you can make a joke about chiefs yeah. and Indians or indigenous people, but uh, I digress. 18 of the 20 chiefs make over $200,000. They're mostly, most of them close to a quarter million. Amazing. So our nominees are the three highest right, now, paid... Okay, now let, let's go back to it. So, uh, it, you know, I guess so used to hearing this stuff, I become almost blasé. Because I've seen so many outrageous, yeah, uh, it, it's yeah, it's like uh, uh, I don't know what to compare it to, but you just become desensitized to the uh, to the violence uh, here. But but the, these are county employees, county employees, and uh, they are basically pharmacists. 
Ph- Who, pharmacy services chief. That's actually a term, chief. C-H-I-E-F. Chief. chief. And so okay. these guys obviously work in a variety of, of hospitals and other medical facilities, I would imagine. And yeah. uh, uh, and so you're, you're dealing with chiefs, and they're very there are a number of different levels. And so presumably, over and above these 20 chiefs, the whole bunch of Indians. That's what we, we can assume so, but there's wow. some pretty good ones in here. Okay, go ahead. Now, our, our three nominees are just doing by nominee number one, the pharmacy chief level one. Highest yes. paid person in that category racks up $244,000 in pay and benefits. Jeez. Nominee number two, pharmacy civil uh, services chief level two. Highest employee, he's sitting down, $917,000 Whoa. in pay and benefits. Whoa. Whoa. Nine, oh, man. And, and then a number three, and I'm not sure whether this goes up or down, but the middle one does very well. Yeah. Nominee number three, pharmacy services chief level three, $287,000 in salary and benefits. Oh, now, man. We, uh, dr- now it's, it's obvious where we're going here, so let's have a drum roll and I'll do the winner. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, yeah. Drum roll, please. Everybody get out your RF. And the winner of this week's Government Grifter Award is... Nominee number two, Pharmacy Services Chief Level Two, nine hundred and seventeen thousand dollars. Unbelievable. Let me, go, let me go. Let me go down this by category. Here's a real kicker: Regular pay, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars with no overtime. Wow. Other wow. pay, what, other pay, whatever that is, seventy thousand dollars. Benefits, pensions, sick pay, all that, ninety-seven thousand. Total of nine hundred seventeen thousand dollars. How in the heck? Does someone earn seven hundred fifty thousand dollars with regular pay, no overtime in one fiscal year, and no one any best in that category in regular pay made more than one hundred eighty six? Yeah, yeah. We we need to put a reporter on this. I think I know part of the explanation, but it's still no excuse. And part of it is you know delayed vacations, accumulated this and that, and everything else. It, it's it's what they do. In fact, I think uh, uh, Jonathan. Uh, for our RFLA, uh, for anybody who goes on signs up for a monthly contribution, we need to have the official Radio Free Los Angeles air sickness bags, right? It says, <laughs> yeah. government, it says government grifter of the week award, right? And then every week when we have this drop is a... ceiling. Yeah, yeah, drop from the <laughs> ceiling. Yeah, get out your barf bags. Yeah. We're going to have government uh, grifter of the nailer. week. I think we need to work on a sound effect. <laughs> All right. Hey, yeah, that music means we're almost done. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Juan Tierra, Josh Jacobs, Jonathan Wilson, and, yes, Matthew Alexander. It's good to have you here, and we'll see you all next week. Same time, 7, uh, excuse me, 8 o'clock next week. See you then. Bye-bye.